And we're getting the message from Vinny this morning, so yeah. Check one, two. Can you hear me? Yes, all right. One person can, can hear me this morning. Awesome. I'm just going to go straight to Jim right now. Hello? Is anyone here? All right, cool. Uh, how's everyone doing this morning? Doing well. I'm doing well as well. I, uh, I am very, I'm very enthused to be able to preach this morning. It's, a, uh, it's no small task to go into God's Word and to study what God's Word has to say and to uh, put together sermons and to preach. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which I do it um, almost with trembling because I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to teach you falsely. I don't want to teach you things that aren't, uh, that aren't correct or that aren't in line with God's way. If you're not careful, that's something that can happen. So um, I do appreciate everybody listening this morning and having the uh, opportunity to be able to preach. So... Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be in verses 16 and 17. And the, the question I want to I pose to you is, where do you get your instruction for your life as a believer? Where is the most important place that you can go to get instruction? See, we live in a world full of books and ideas and philosophies and and teachers that everybody has the way. Everybody has the right way. Uh, tons of self-help books, tons of groups, but uh, as believers, there's a place that we should go. There's a place that we can go that will never change, and that is our default. It should be our priority, the number one source of information for us as believers, and that is Scripture. You, what I'm going to talk about today, you may have heard before. You may have heard this message many, many times. And you might go, I know that. But if you're like me, uh, we need reminders. I need to be reminded. Uh, I need to be stirred up. I might have read something and I go, oh, I've got that. I figured that one out. I can put that one away. I've learned that. But I need to be reminded. And that is why we should go to the Word every day and to learn. So... This, what we're going to talk about this morning, is something that's it's near and dear to my heart because it's something that I've seen the effects of in my life. When I went to Washington, when I went to the mountain, I spent day in and day out in the scriptures, and I saw the effect that it had in my life, being able to put into practice the things that God says. So I hope that this morning it would be near and dear to your heart as well. So let's read together First, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And today, in this scripture, we are going to look at three components that make scripture very important for the life of the believer. The first component that we're going to look at that makes Scripture very important for the life of the believer is that Scripture comes from God. So when you go to the Word and when you read the Word, what are these words to you? Are they just words? Are they a cool story? Are they man's words? Are they only man's words to you? Or are they God's words? Are they divine revelation? Or a fairy tale. For us as believers, when we come to the scripture, we believe these to be the very words of God. The foundation that is all truth. It's our definition of truth. It's divine truth. But why? Why do we believe this? Ever ask yourself that question? Why do we believe this to be the very words of God? Well, it says right here. Verse 16, the beginning says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I need my water. Thank you. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? What does it mean that all scripture is given by inspiration of God? Let's take a look at that statement. 
the word scripture that's used here. I don't want to get real deep into another language and try to figure all that out, but it does help us figure out a little bit, a little deeper of what is being said. So the word scripture comes from a Greek word that is, it sounds like graphic. It's the word we get graph from. It's a, basically, it paints this picture of uh, literally a piece of paper that is written. So, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration. We get that word inspiration from two Greek words that are put together. Uh, it's like a compound word. The first word is theo. The second word is pneuma. One means God, one means to breathe. And when you put it together, it's theonuskos, which basically means God breathe. We, all scripture is God breathe. That's where we get the word inspiration from. So we can uh, define the word inspiration as God breathe. And if you read some other translations, it says that. It says all scripture is God breathe. Inspiration really, in its true sense, is not talking about when somebody is motivated to do something. Sometimes we throw that word loosely around and we go, well, I was inspired to do this. But the true sense of the word inspiration means God breathed. The same way that God breathed the breath of life into Adam is the same way we're talking about here in the scriptures. All scripture is God breathed. So inspiration is the act upon which God revealed his truth to human writers, and those human writers wrote down the words that they uh, that was revealed to them. They wrote down the words of Scripture. Then they weren't inspired. The men, the, the men weren't inspired. Uh, God wasn't inspired, and God wasn't inspiring the men, but the words that they wrote down were inspired. The words were God's words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So how can we simply put that? That all that is written is God breathed. The scriptures breathed out by God. The things that we read breathe out by God. Amen. And not just man's words. So like I said, the human writers, they were not inspired. God was not inspired. The words, they are inspired. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says this, that knowing this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Because prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, God... Reveals his truth, which is revelation. He reveals his truth to men, holy men of God. They receive that information and they wrote down the words, which is what we have in front of us today, the Bible. The words of God. What does this look like? So how can, it, how can we understand this? Exodus 19. Uh, this is Moses. Moses, in Exodus 19, he goes up to the mountain. And in verse 3, it says, Moses went up from God. We don't have it up here. You don't have to turn to it. It says, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So Moses goes up to the mountain of God, and he receives Torah from the Lord, the law, the law of Moses, the, the, the first five books, essentially the law. And he receives that from the Lord and he delivers it to the nation Israel. Who, even though it was Moses who told them what those words were, they believed those words to be the very word of God. See, what, what Moses wrote down didn't come from himself. He didn't come up with the idea. It wasn't a matter of his own interpretation. It wasn't a matter of his own... Um, it didn't come from himself. Those words came from God, and he delivered it to the nation Israel. Thus, the law was inspired by God, revealed to Moses, and delivered to Israel, so that the very words that they heard, though through man, were God's words. So when God told him that, he 
you go on and you read from Exodus on, and then you've got the Ten Commandments, you've got all the laws, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you have those things that are written in there. And that is a great way for us to understand the same way that Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Those words were literally breathed out by God, delivered to Moses. Moses delivered them to Israel, though it came through a man, though it was man's words in the sense that it came through a man, that those words were the word of God, and that is the same thing we're talking about here. So, I ask my question again. What is Scripture to you? Are they just man's words? Or... Are they God's words? Because how we view Scripture, how we view the words written here from Genesis to Revelation, is going to greatly affect how we respond to them. If they're just man's words, it's just like anything else. Like any other book that is written. I can take it or leave it. Oh, I like this. I don't like that. Oh, it's not important. It doesn't have authority. It's just a guy writing down his idea. And so if I don't agree with it, then I can just <coughs> leave it to the side. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is useful. This isn't useful. We get to pick and choose in that sense. But if we view Scripture as the very words of God, it changes the way we look at it. it changes the way we're going to respond to it. Because it becomes final. It becomes sure. It has authority. We don't get to take it or leave it. Oh, sure, we can try to take it or leave it. We can try to go, oh, I don't like that. But if they're the very words of God, then we start to work through the hard stuff. You know, you come across the scriptures and you're like, ah, oh, I don't like this. I don't agree with that. Then you work through it. They're God's words. They're not man's words. If, if these are not God's words to us, then what we're going to talk about the rest of this morning is almost becomes invalid because then they're not God's words, so that's a whole authority, and we're not going to we're not going to listen or take heed to anything else. They're God's words. Hebrews four twelve says the word of God is living and is powerful. It's sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And is the discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. God's words, they cut. They discern. They know the intents of the heart. So since scripture comes from God, this is our foundation for the rest of everything we're going to talk about. Since scripture comes from God, then it is very important in the life of the believer. And being the very life source by which we know all truth, and it's the standard by which we know what to do. And that's going to lead us to our second component. Second component that makes Scripture very important for the life of the believer is that Scripture is our tutor. Scripture is our tutor. Verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning all that is written is God-breathed and is profitable. For four things, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Scripture is our tutor. So everybody has a code by which, by which they live. We have moral codes, um, there's municipal codes, there's police codes, there's city codes. Some families, we've got a family code, you know, we've got the man code. Uh, You've got street code, you've got jail code, you've got all kinds of different codes that we live by. But if we believe these to be the very words of God, then as believers, Scripture is our code. So, Scripture is our tutor. The first thing it's profitable for is doctrine. Doctrine is a set of beliefs that are taught or teaching. Which brings us to this understanding in theology. Whether you're learning it, whether you like it, whether you love it, or you hate it, or you say you don't even need it. Everyone has a form of it. What you believe about God is theology. It is some sort of theology that someone has come up with. or So it's your the theology basically means a word about God. It's the study about God. 
Everyone has a form of it, and everyone develops it in a different spot. Some people develop through their experiences, which change. So, their theology changes. Some through Christian writers, which that also changes at times. Or, you develop your theology from the Bible. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for teaching us a set of beliefs, the things we believe. There's things that we believe about God that, that have been compiled into different sections and we put words to them through study. You've got different, here's types of doctrines that are taught. You've got theology proper, it's a study of the existence of God. So we all actually have a bit of that, though we don't really think about, oh, I'm thinking theology proper here, but it is the study of the existence of God. We've got the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin. We've got the doctrine of Christ. We've got the doctrine of salvation. Which is, you know, the act of God upon which he makes the dead sinner alive in Christ. When that dead sinner puts his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We've got the doctrine of assurance. Meaning that you can be sure of your salvation because you see these things happening in your life. You have the doctrine of security. Which is the, the idea that if God saved you, then he's going to be faithful to complete that until the day of the Lord. You've got the doctrine of uh, salvation again, sanctification that if you are saved, if He has saved you, then you are going to become more like Him until the day of the Lord. You've got the doctrine of hell, heaven, sin, uh, end times. It's all in here. Whether you say, I don't need theology, you actually have one, you actually believe one. And if you believe these things, you believe you have a theology. And it would do us well to study this a little bit more. See, when you discover these things, when I was on the mountain and I discovered these things, I, something happened. I became enriched. I became enriched in, in this true knowledge. And, this, and my eyes and my understanding were opened. And I felt like it became solid. Like I was grounded in a truth that was no longer hidden. First John. Chapter 2, verse 27. It says, But the anointing, talking about the Holy Spirit, which you have received from Him, abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him saying that the anointing that we have, the Holy Spirit, is what teaches us. It is what teaches us the truth of God when we spend time reading God's Word. As you sit and read God's Word and apply yourself, understanding that the work that is happening, you apply yourself diligently, which isn't wrong to do. The Holy Spirit is actually doing a work inside of you, teaching the things you need to know about God. Teaching things that you need to know. Teaching you to understand the words of God. Essentially, you really don't even need us up here. You don't need me or Josh or Jason or Jimmy or anyone else who preaches. All we really are are just beggars showing other beggars where the bread is. The bread's right here. Theology is beautiful. Study, study with the Lord is the best study. It's not like studying math. Studying math sucks. You know? It's not like studying for an exam or, you know, that, that's really not that fun. But when you open up the words of God, I like to do it with coffee. And you sit and you read and you ask the Lord, Lord, understanding that the anointing that comes from Him is the one who teaches you. You don't need a teacher, He's the teacher, right? And if the Holy Spirit's in you, He's teaching you right now. That you spent time and go, Lord, just show me. Show me, Lord. And you spend time reading. Don't stop. Don't just ask. I don't understand this. Lord, I don't understand this. Tell me that. I don't understand this. And read. And I promise you. Not I promise you. I just can promise you because the word says it. I don't promise you anything. You don't want me to promise you anything. The, the Lord... The Lord will teach you true theology, true understanding doctrine. It promotes genuine worship. Yeah. It promotes uh, it 
promotes, really it promotes unity, whether you want to think so or not. Actually it does. It promotes unity. Because we all start, we're all starting to get on the same page and we're all understanding, oh Lord, Lord, look at your truth. Do you know this truth? Yeah, I do. Man, it's wonderful. Sometimes division starts to happen because you'll have a, a section of people that God's not important. You don't need to know. You don't need to understand the things that are in here. It's just man's word. Take it or leave it. But if we spend time learning about God, it deepens the relationship with God. Uh, think about this. You're in a relationship with somebody. You have a friend or you have a boyfriend or girlfriend you're wanting to get to know. And, or maybe you're not wanting to get to know. And you, uh, not, it's kind of like this idea that not studying God's word is kind of like hanging out with that person, wanting all their benefits, but not wanting to know anything about them. I want you to pay for my meal. I want you to fix my car. I want you to come over and take care of me. Tell me all the things you like about me. But I will never, ever spend one minute learning what you stand for, what you like, the thing, your story, your history, your values. Is that really a relationship? That's not a relationship. It's very one-sided. Not spending time understanding, reading, learning about God's, God's ways, His Word, very simple. It doesn't deepen the relationship if we don't spend time reading what He stands for, reading His ways, reading His story, reading about Him. So Scripture, given by God, God breathed is profitable for doctrine and it also is profitable for reproof. It's true, God saved us by His grace and then not of ourselves. It's all of Him. He saved us because He decided to and how good is that? But since this is true, that what comes after that is uh, that we would start to live obedient lives. Scripture is profitable for reproof. Scripture instructs us also is our tutor in the form of reproof when we do things contrary to God's words and God's way. When we're disobedient. See, if we ever, if you're like me, and you are, very similar, we all have different personalities, but we're all under the same curse. When we spend time in God's word, you're going to come across some things that make you go, ah, mm, that hurts. That doesn't, he says do this, and this does not line up with my life. This does not line up with what I do. It cuts. Like I said, like but we not like I said, like Hebrew said, that it's living and powerful, it's active. It cuts going in, it's a double-edged sword, really sharp. It cuts going in, it cuts coming out. Another dynamic workout. Alright. So it cuts going in, it cuts coming out. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And when I read God's word, and there's things I'm doing, or I'm living in a sin, that I'm willingly living in sin, and I come across something that says, no, you shouldn't do that. It cuts. By the same spirit that, that reveals us the truth is the same spirit that will convict us when we read things in God's words that reprove us. Reproving is another word for, you can say rebuke. It might sound a little harsh. Or you can say convict. They're kind of synonyms. They kind of they all go together. Scripture is profitable to teach us the things about God, and it is profitable to reprove us. For some examples, 1 John 3, 17 talks about giving. He says, if you have this world's goods, and you see your brother in need, and you don't help him, the love of God is not in you. Ow. How many times have I done? hurts. First Thessalonians 4.3 says the will of God for you is, to be, is in sanctification is to be sexually pure. If I'm a believer living in sexual sin, and I read that, it should. It should cut. It should hurt. If, uh, if I'm abusing spiritual gifts and I come across 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and I'm abusing spiritual gifts, it should reprove me and go, hey, you're doing it all wrong. This is not how we're supposed to roll. Or if I worry, Matthew 6, 33, our Lord says, don't worry. Look at the birds. They don't worry. 
You're, he says that, look at the birds. They don't worry. Look at the flowers. They're flowers. He says, they don't worry. Why do you worry? If I'm living a life of worry, and I see that, it should reprove me. And I would go, all right, Lord. But reproof was not complete without the second part here. It says doctrine is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. The scripture just, the Lord just doesn't leave us out of proof. He doesn't go, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. No, he's like, this is what you're doing wrong, and now this is how you can make it right. Scripture is profitable for correction. Correction is making wrong, making straight. The word that's used there is the idea of taking something that's not straight and straightening it back up. It gives us, in his infinite love, in God's infinite love for us, he doesn't leave us at the proof. He says, all right, child, this is what you're doing. All right, this is what you should do. Do this instead. In our submission to God, believers, you're submitted to God. You're saved. Sealed. In your proper response, proper, <laughs> proper response to being reproved in Scripture is to go, all right, Lord, I'm going to correct this. It's not wrong to say, I'm going to correct this. Sometimes there's this idea, no, I'm not going to do it, but God's got to do it. He's giving you a spirit, and he's giving you a mind, and he's giving you a will, and he's giving you an ability to change, to make a choice. So if I see something that's wrong, then, Lord, I'm depending on you. I'm going to start taking steps forward. Yeah. You're walking with me, Lord. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start correcting this, Lord. We do all of this, again, according to God's word. How do we correct? Well, Ephesians, starting in the chapter 4, verse 25, is actually a great example where he reproves. Paul, actually, the Lord through Paul, reproves and corrects all at the same time. It says, therefore, putting away lying, so don't lie, speak the truth with one another. Speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down. On your wrath. It says, nor give place to the devil. Let's say, let him who steals, so don't steal, but instead, rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who is in need. So, someone like me, the old life, I was a thief. That's what I did. It says, let him who steal. Stole, steal no longer, but instead, so what's the reproof? Don't steal. How do you correct it? Don't just not steal. It's not saying you find that I find that interesting. He doesn't say, oh, don't just steal anymore. Don't don't steal. No, he says, actually work and give. Work with the intention of giving to those who are in need. That's how you correct that problem. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good and necessary for edification. Uh, I like here how he puts this idea that it's not just about not doing the thing anymore, it's about doing the opposite. So instead of having corrupt speech, edify one another, encourage one another, lift each other up. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, wrath, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and instead be kind tender-hearted, and forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for teaching us the ways about God, teaching us a set of beliefs, teaching us the things of God, is profitable to reprove us, to show us where, where we are wrong, but then it is also profitable to correct us, to show us how to make that wrong right. Scripture will show us where we are wrong, shows us how to make the wrong right, and it is our responsibility, church, to search these things out. Again, the theme is according to Scripture, not according to what I think, my opinion, not reading the book of, you know, First Opinions chapter 4. It is a need to read God's Word to understand how to make my wrongs right. 
all these things we have spoken of really is in itself. In essence, the last part of this is instruction in righteousness. Scripture instructs us on how to live righteously, on how to live in accordance with the divine all moral law. Again, we're not saved based on the things we've done, as I've said before, but now in a different way, that we're going to start walking out what we have become. What have we become? What was in exchange for our sin? The righteousness of Christ. You now have been made righteous. If you are saved this morning, you have been made righteous. Scripture instructs us now on how to walk that righteousness out. For some, I suppose, and it has happened, that the person, the newly converted person is saved, and like an overnight thing, they are like, Psh, done. Needle's gone, alcohol's gone, gambling's gone, whatever, lying's gone, and they are all of a sudden, they're like, right on the right path. That could happen, I suppose. But for most of us, that's not like that. And we we need to learn. But how do we learn again? Um, do I walk over and open up the book of Second Opinions? Or am I going to open up, uh, you know, Second Timothy? How do, I, how do I know what that looks like? How do I know how to walk righteously? Well, God's word will instruct us on how to walk righteously. We learn to walk righteously. It comes from a day in and day out. Time spent in the word. Reading it. Breathing it. Devouring it. Craving it. God's word. Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We renew our minds. This is a great scripture. This really is, in essence, explaining what repentance is. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But how are we renewing our mind? We renew our mind by spending time in God's Word. We are not conformed to the world, but we would be transformed by changing the way we think, which will result in a change of behavior. That we could prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That by spending time in God's Word, day in and day out, and we start to put in practice the things that we see in here, we start to live in an outward sense, righteous. God is calling us to live righteously. So, again, the second component of Scripture that makes it important in the life of the believer is Scripture is our tutor. Scripture teaches us the things of God's ways, things about God, His ways, that's doctrine. It shows us where we are wrong. Reproof. Shows us how to make that wrong right. Correction. And shows us how to walk that out on a day-to-day -day basis. Instruction in righteousness. Why? So that, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Which leads to our third component. The third component is that makes Scripture very important in the life of the believer is that Scripture is sufficient. The sufficiency of Scripture is this idea that Scripture is enough to tell you everything you need to know on how to live. Scripture is sufficient for the life of the believer. I'm not talking about learning math. I'm not talking about learning engineering. I'm not talking about learning guitar. I'm talking about living Scripture is sufficient in the life of the believer that, to teach us how to live. How should I treat others? You've got Ten Commandments there. It shows you exactly, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Why? Well, we shouldn't kill, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't want what other people have. You know, we shouldn't take each other's wives. We shouldn't, these, we sh shouldn't do that. If that is a good example on how I should treat others. How should I treat my wife? Ephesians 5 says to wash her with the word, to, to, to uh, be as Christ was for the church, to essentially lay down your life for your wife. 
How should I act at work? Colossians 3 says that you should do it unto the Lord. And if you have masters above you, that you shouldn't uh, should steal from them, and that you, should, uh, you shouldn't grumble and complain, but you should work as you would to the Lord. How should I worship God? Again, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, with everything that you are. How should I worship God? With everything that I am. Everything that is about me. Scripture is sufficient to teach you, a leader in the church or pastor, how to pastor and lead a church. We read in, in both Timothy's and Titus. This is how I should lead a church. And right here, if we were to continue uh, te uh, reading here, would tell me why I should preach the word. Why, as a person, should you preach the word? It says because people are not going to endure sound doctrine at some point, and you should preach the word whether they want to hear it or not, in season and out of season. Doctrine, uh, scripture is sufficient to teach us what the end is going to be like. You see this theme here. Scripture is sufficient. You, believer, do not need anything else to tell you how to live. You don't need to buy a book on God's will to learn about God's will. You don't need someone to tell you this is what God wants you to do in your life. He has already told you. The specifics that God wants you to do for your life is not going to fall outside of the general things he wants you to do. So that is that you would be saved, that you would be sexually pure, that you would be serving, that you would be thankful, that you would be submitted to authority. If these things are happening, the specific things that he wants you to do will fall in line with those things. So if you want to know what God wants you, what God's will is for you, start doing the general things. Be saved, be sexually pure. Be thankful, be serving, be submitted, be giving. You will find the specific will in that. Yeah. As a believer, we don't need to go to anywhere else to learn the things about God. Scripture comes from God, it's profitable to teach us, and it is sufficient to equip us for every good work. Sometimes we forget about that. We feel like scripture is not a, a sufficient. I'm telling you, if you spend every day in here, by the time you get to the end, you're going to need to go back to the beginning because you're going to forget everything that's in there. And you go over and over and over and over and over. You keep going through it. And what ends up happening is you start to remember more and more. But we can do this our whole lives and still not grasp everything that is in here. Scripture is sufficient. Since it comes from God and is profitable to teach us, Scripture is sufficient because it thoroughly equips us, complete for every good work. Scripture is enough. So, brothers and sisters, we have something that is very, very special. We have it at our disposal on a daily basis. We have here the very words of God. It's not my opinion that it is the very words of God. Scripture says it's given by inspiration of God. We have it is profitable to teach us. It's profitable to reprove us, to correct us, and to instruction, instruct us on how to live righteously. To do everything we need to do during our present time here on earth. So, what, what are you going to do with this? I've given you all this information. That scripture are, is these things. This is the nature of scripture. So what do we do? Something I learned in Washington. Something that has been so beneficial. If you have a pen and paper, I want you to write this down. If not, I want you to listen intently on what I'm going to say here. This is important because sometimes we come with so many excuses that I don't understand what God is saying. I can never understand the Bible. The Bible says a lot of things that I don't know. The Bible says a lot of things that are hard for me to swallow and chew or I just don't understand. It's like a bunch of gibberish. I don't understand what it means. So I'm going to leave you with some practical things that you can use. You can put into practice today and you would start to understand God's word. When you open up God's word, understanding that the anointing that he has given you is what teaches you 
do these things. First, understand it literally. Meaning, literally meaning according to its literary style. Meaning, if, if you're reading a portion of the Bible that is history, you would read it as history. If you're reading a portion of the Bible that is poetry, read it as poetry. If you're reading a portion of the Bible that is what's called an allegory, means something actually represents something else in the story, that's what you would interpret that as. If you're reading something that is directly teaching something, then you would interpret it as something that is directly teaching something. It's the same idea. I read the funnies in the newspaper like the funnies, and then I read the menu at the restaurant like the menu. I don't overlap and go, well, this is the funnies and this is the menu, and I want Marmaduke for lunch. You don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't interpret it that way. So we interpret it by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read it according to its literary style, literally. That's what literally means. Not meaning when, when the Lord says, you got to chop off your hand. No. What would we understand that as? A figure of speech. You would interpret that as a figure of speech. Okay. What's the principle behind what he is saying? You remove the things in your life that are causing you to sin. You work through that stuff. The second is you would read it contextually and grammatically, meaning that what is being said can be understood by what is being said before, or what is being said after, or what is being said in the entire book, or what is being said in the entire teaching of the New Testament, or what is being said. You can, you can, you can understand one portion by understanding the larger portion. If you take the one portion out of the larger portion, then you can turn what that small portion says into anything you want find yourself in a bad way and you start we get we have entire denominations that are built that way oh we're going to take this one part out and that's what we're standing on and we forget what that thing says in light of everything else so we understand it contextually and grammatically meaning that the words are being used were used for a reason so we have to understand that that if we understand any sort of sense of grammar at all that we're going to read it like like anything else, that we go, okay, that word is here, that word is here, and we put those words together, and it creates this idea. Contextually, grammatically. And the, the uh, third part is that we would understand it historically. So literally, contextually, grammatically, and historically. Historically meaning that we would understand the things that are going on at that time, the culture that is going on, uh, the culture that it's a part of. If you understand the history and the culture, you can greatly even understand it and get a deeper understanding as to what is being said. Sometimes there are things that are said in here that are slang terms that if you understood the culture, oh, that makes much more sense now. Understanding it historically. We use 2 Timothy. This book, he talks about all scripture being inspiration of God. It's profitable to teach us and it's sufficient. Well, the idea is when Paul wrote this to Timothy, Timothy was a leader of a church in Ephesus. And he was wavering. He was losing hope. Paul writes this letter to admonish him, to encourage him, to tell him this is how you should conduct yourself in church meetings, essentially. And then this is how you battle, battle error with scripture. Understanding the flavor, understanding the history and the culture flavors the message that we read. So when we read, we should ask ourselves, what was, and the band can come up, what was the original author saying to the original audience? What was Paul saying to Timothy and why? Because then, after I understand what Paul said to Timothy and why Paul said this to Timothy, then I go, okay, now what does it mean? My first question, when I go to God's Word, that Scripture is very important in the life of the believer. When I go to God's Word, my first question is not, what does this mean to me? Because when my mood changes, the meanings change. And I start to take the message that was put in front of me and twisting it to whatever I want it to be. But if I go, well, Paul said this to Timothy and why? Okay, now what does it mean to me? Facing the application in my life upon the original message. Why is all this important? Because you can understand the Bible. You can understand what is being said here if you apply yourself diligently, understanding that as you apply yourself diligently, the Holy Spirit really is the one doing the work. 
Hard work and the Holy Spirit. They go hand in hand. If we only applied ourselves, if we only applied ourselves a little bit, you can learn the things of God, you can understand God's ways, and you can grow in greater, deeper understanding of who He is and what He wants you to do. So I pray this morning that you, all of you in here, along with myself, that we would gain a deeper understanding for God's Word, a deeper thirst, a deeper hunger that would never ever be quenched. If, if this is something that rings true in your heart, I would like you to come up to the front and, and, and get down on your knees and ask God to make this very true in your life. Love you guys. Thank you for listening to what was said this morning. I pray that it would take deep root in your lives.